discuss basically this is this will probably be the maybe the headiest talk I'm, I'm, I am gonna ask I'm gonna try to we're gonna elevate ourselves and think about some rather I think profound and deep things that maybe we don't often think about but I title it Our Lady in God's plan of salvation let's go ahead and begin with a prayer this is also one of the prayers that the angel at Fatima taught the children in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost amen most Holy Trinity Father Son and Holy Ghost I adore thee profoundly and I offer thee the most precious body blood soul and divinity of Jesus Christ present in all the tabernacles of the world in reparation for the outrages sacrileges and indifference with which he himself is offended and through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and of the immaculate heart of Mary I beg of thee the conversion of poor sinners Amen. sacred heart of Jesus immaculate heart of Mary Good Saint Joseph. Pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Just a brief recap. Yesterday we did talk about true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, how it's necessary for salvation, how we find it in sacred tradition, scripture, magisterium, the saints. You're a member of Mary, there is never enough. We can never praise, honor, love her enough. Saint Bernard's quote, De Maria, num cum satis, and how we want our interior and exterior practices to match to have this authentic devotion to Our Lady and ultimately the goal here is to imitate Christ in his devotion to his own mother so that we can be faithful disciples of Christ. Uh, we do our best to honor her with a soul that is free of sin. Right? That's who Mary is. We do our best to persevere in our devotion to her. We also had a quick recap on the message of Our Lady of Fatima that God desires to save our souls. He really wants to save the world because of his great love but he will only do so through her immaculate heart and that's what the message of Fatima is about we talked about the secret of Fatima the vision of hell consecration of Russia the first Saturday devotion and a little bit about the third secret that still remains hidden talked about the miracle of the Sun the need to amend our lives and to live this message through the acronym so we can remember the basic elements being Roman Catholics and sending up a plea to heaven this SOS uh, we're on the bark of Peter which is in some tumultuous waves right now the R is for the rosary C is to pray for Russia's consecration. Encourage you to consecrate yourself to Our Lady. The S is for the scapular, wear the brown scapular. The O is to offer, offer prayer and penance. Um, and then the last S is for the first Saturday devotion. And never forget her ultimate promise, what we know is inevitable. In the end, this will happen, and her immaculate heart will triumph, and the world will experience a period of peace. So it really is, you know, this great, just like the resurrection is this great, message of hope ultimately the gospel is a great message of hope because we know in the end Christ is conquered and if we are faithful with him we will gain eternal life with him forever in heaven which is what we were made for similarly we know that we are destined here on this earth for a wonderful time the likes of which the world has never seen it will be a period of great blessing a period of great flourishing for truth in the Catholic faith uh, where, where many 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 will convert to the Catholic faith and there'll be peace in the world so it's something really to look forward to, but also to strive very hard to get to, and that that's at the heart of Our Lady's message. So if we want to talk about Our Lady and God's plan, we don't just go to the beginning, right? Scripture begins, in the beginning. I'm trying to say, well, let's go before the beginning, which is difficult for us to do. I mean, we have to remember we are beings that live within time and space, but time and space are things that God has also created. Right? Time and space do not apply to God. God is outside of those. He has always been. He always will be. He's always existed. And so there is a before the beginning when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are because they are existence. They're always there. And we could ask, with the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, what, what is the plan that God has? And so from, the, from before the beginning, God does have a plan that his son, his word, his eternal word, St. John will call it the Logos in his gospel. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. We translate in English as word. Sometimes Logos is a better Greek word because it really means like logic, the thinking, the reasoning, the understanding, the very mind of God is his son. And that's always in his mind. It's, it's like God only speaks one word, and that word is his son. But he always has the intention that his son will become incarnate. His son will take on flesh. His son will need a created world 
in which he will reign as a king in his humanity. And so really the reason God begins to create is certainly because he, he shares his love with us. His love overflows. In fact, they talk about how the love, the exchange of love between the Father and the Son is the Holy Ghost, another person. Um, and that love overflows into other created beings. God wants to create so that he can share his love with these created beings. But it's ultimately stemming from the love he has for his Son, who is the Holy Ghost. Okay? That, that's why he wants to create. That's why the angels are created. And that's why we human beings are created. Because God's love is so great, he wants to share it out of his goodness. But that means from the very beginning, there's this understanding that his son will become a man and share that life with us. And therefore, even before he creates the angels or says, let there be light, even before that, he already has in his one eternal mind that his son will become flesh and that he will have a human mother that will give him this flesh. And so we could say the second part of the very first thought of God and the original thought, and really in a sense the only thought, is the Blessed Virgin Mary. She, she's there from the beginning, from before creation, before the angels. Our Blessed Mother is already there. And God then is going to create this great world, a supernatural spiritual world with all the angels, of which there are billions and billions and billions, many, many more angels than, than men. And he'll create men, and they will all serve as the subjects in this wonderful kingdom for his son, the king, and his mother, the queen. So all of creation, the angels and you and I, we exist to be the loyal and loving subjects of our dear king and our dear queen. And our joy will lie therein because that's why we're created. We're not going to be satisfied and happy or fulfilled unless we are in that kingdom with our king and our lady. It's, it's really something quite uh, uh, amazing, okay? But this is, this is the, the initial plan of God. So then he creates. And the church fathers will say when he says in the beginning he created and he created light, that light actually represents the angels. And when there's a separation of light and darkness, the darkness are the dark angels that fell. So in the first day, you could say, of creation, we already have the great battle between the devils and the angels. And one can ask, why is it that these beings that were created, that are pure spirit, uh, they have a mind and a will, so they can love and they can choose, and they're destined for eternal life as well. They will not die, but they're there to serve their king and their queen. And God basically tests them. And the way he tests them is he does tell each one of them their specific purpose, why they're created, because each angel has a specific purpose. And part of that purpose fits the grand plan, which is to serve the king and the queen. And the understanding we have from various different mystics and saints is that when God tells them about this plan that his son, who is their king, will take on human flesh, it doesn't quite sit right with some of them who are quite prideful. And they think to themselves, well, if God is going to assume this other nature, why does he not assume an angelic nature? Our angelic nature is far superior to this human nature that will be created. It'd be more fitting for him to become one of us and for us to share in the divine nature, which they're not going to get. They don't get the grace that the, the men get. God always picks the most humble. And so men will be elevated higher than angels in the final grand scheme of God's plan, even though they're superior to us in nature. But nevertheless, maybe that just begins the resistance within Lucifer and the other rebellious angels. But then they hear that not only is it that God himself will take on this human nature, but there will be a human not even a divine creature, a human creature, who will be their queen. And they will have to serve. Right? They will bow before her and they will be her subjects. And at that moment, the pride of Lucifer is too great and he says, I will not serve. This is not the plan I will accept. I refuse to serve a lady, a human nature, a human creature. I reject God's plan because I'm greater. And this is the fall of Lucifer. And so what we understand is actually the fall of Lucifer is very, very connected with our Blessed Mother. And the rest of history will be the great battle between the Lady and the Dragon, which we see in Scripture represented in numerous occasions. And so Lucifer cries out, non serviam. And then, of course, you have a very lowly and humble angel who rises up to defend God's holy honor. And in Latin, we say, often see it on a shield, quis ut Deus, who is like unto God. Like that is the Hebrew name for Michael. So basically, that's his battle cry. 
sort of asking Lucifer, how dare you place yourself so high? Who is like unto God? Don't, don't you dare think that you are like unto God. Right? You have to have a lower place. But there's another flip side to what that's saying, who is like unto God? Because that's a question. Who, who is like unto God? Well, we would say, certainly Jesus Christ in his incarnate, when we see, you know, he'll tell his apostles, you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus Christ is obviously the very, the very form of God in human likeness. And as well as the one who is made most perfect, who is without sin, who is the most perfect creature that has ever been created, and that's our Blessed Mother. Our Blessed Mother is most like God. All human beings are made in the image of God, but as Genesis tells us, we're made in the image and likeness. And the image we have, because we have a mind and a will, and we can choose good and know the truth, but our likeness to God is really our, our sanctity. How much like God are we? Well, our Blessed Mother is perfectly like God, as much as any creature in the angelic realm or in the human realm could be like God. And so really when St. Michael raises that battle cry, he's also defending Our Lady's honor because he's trying to tell Satan, you have rejected God's plan, yet look at Mary. We should all be so grateful that we get to love her and honor her and praise her for all eternity because she is like God. You, Lucifer, are not like unto God and neither am I the way she is. So it's fascinating that already this is all taking place really before any of creation and this begins to give us great insight into Mary's role in God's plan for salvation and why she's so essential to it. Well, then we get to our creation. We know that God creates our first parents, Adam and Eve, Eve coming from his side, which is obviously important because at the cross, there'll be a spear that pierces our Lord and blood and water will flow, which are the sacraments, and his bride, the church, will come forth from his side. So the great parallels between Eve coming forth from Adam's side and the church coming forth from Christ's side. Um, they're obviously made, Adam and Eve, they're made without sin. And they have a body and soul. Likewise, Jesus Christ is clearly made without sin in his humanity, but so is Blessed Mother. So the new Adam and the new Eve likewise will be made without sin, as is the church made without sin. They're certainly made for eternal life. We will not die. Our soul is immortal. So we hear when we say God saw all that he had made and it was very good because he destines us for eternal life and for the same reason, to serve the king and the queen. And God blesses them saying increase and multiply. So fill creation with many souls who will be part of this wonderful kingdom and share in the great love that the blessed Trinity has. And they're also made for the beatific vision uh, and to partake in the divine nature in a way, the angels do get the beatific vision, but not the partaking in the divine nature the way we do, because Christ has assumed our human nature. But of course, they're also going to be tested, just like the angels were tested. And that, we know, is about the tree in the garden of which they were not to eat, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we know then that our first parents fell. They disobeyed God, and so they fell under the dominion of Satan, and now they would have to suffer death. The consequence of this sin is separation, is alienation. Uh, this came up yesterday, just the concept that all sin creates division and divides. That's the very nature of sin, ultimately separating our body from our soul, which is what death, the moment of death is when our soul and our body are separated. But it creates a division within man himself. All the different parts of him, his mind, his body, his soul, they're no longer in a harmonious union the way they are meant to be. Sin does that. Sin alienates us one from another, and so we lack charity, and we don't have compassion for one another. Sin creates all the division that men have, divides us, and it separates us as well from God. So in every relationship we have within our own selves, with other people, and with God, sin is striking at the heart of that and dividing and separating, whereas God's love would unite us into one. So now our body is subject, as we know, to sickness and death. Our passions become rebellious and self-interested instead of self-giving. We get ignorant minds or minds that are darkened and it becomes more difficult for us to seek and know the truth. And our will becomes malevolent. It becomes weakened as well. And so our will becomes very self-centered. We place ourselves as the center of the universe and there is pride which lies at the root of every single sin. So this is something that we all live with all our lives and it's a battle to overcome these things. And what's very interesting about God, and this will be a theme running here throughout his plan, is that then God, quote-unquote, gives a punishment. But really, 
it, it's not a punishment. I mean, as parents, boy, I wish I could come up with these kinds of punishments. Because the punishment is certainly very appropriate to the crime. He's God, he's perfect. But it's so much more. It actually heals the, the error. And it doesn't just heal the error, but it elevates to a higher level. So it's like we're coming along this way and we have a sin and we fall and God figures out just the right resolution so that he fixes the problem but doesn't just fix it, he then gives us even more grace and takes us up a higher level. It's an amazing way to come up with a quote-unquote punishment because it's not just a punishment, it's this great, again, outpouring of good love. That's why I say if parents could figure out how to do this, you know, you, you'd have a great trick to parenting great children because when they make their errors and their sins, you would not just figure out the right, correct punishment that's going to heal the error in them, whatever is wrong in them, that they're not doing the right thing, and then you're going to raise them up higher. So that even every fall and every sin becomes an opportunity for greater grace. And that's why St. Paul will say, where sin abounded, grace abounds all the more. Right? God is always greater because he's so far above the devil. Right? The devil is nothing compared to God. So everything the devil can do and everything we can do with our sin, God's already got all that figured out and has already figured out a better way to come around this, to get above it. And so he gives them this punishment where, first of all, he tells them, well, you can't eat of the tree of life now. The tree of life is ultimately the Holy Eucharist. It's Jesus Christ himself. It gives eternal life. But they've just been alienated from God. And so if they're alienated from God and now take on eternal life, that's hell. That, that is what hell is. Hell is eternal life alienated from God. And that's why he tells them you can't eat of this tree anymore. And he puts a flaming sword with a cherubim there so that they will not throw themselves into hell now because he wants to save them still. So he doesn't let them do that. Now they know what knowledge of good and evil is, so now he tells them, okay, well now, what was your problem? Your problem was you put yourself first and you were afraid to suffer, right? You were afraid of death and you didn't trust me. Instead, you went with the devil and you trusted what the devil did. So now the solution is you will have to suffer. You will find out that in love and in giving forth life, there will be suffering. It's the perfect cure to it. And so the man will now have to suffer as he labors the land and toils to bring forth the fruit of the earth to provide for his family. And the woman will now travail in labor as she brings forth life into the world. And we're going to have to embrace that suffering for the sake of love. Because that's what our first parents refused to do. And then, because there's that love that brings forth life, you can see how there's an elevation. That the problem has now been fixed. If you get it right, you learn, okay, I can embrace suffering. I will trust God. I will love. And that love that we then share brings forth an abundance of life and draws us closer together and draws us closer to God and makes us more perfect human beings. And so we, we've gone up a level and God shares his own love with us so that, that's grace, so that we can get this elevation. It's amazing that God does this because it's almost like instead of punishing us, he, he's actually rewarding us in more ways and giving us a greater opportunity to get elevated. And this is what our Lord and Our Lady then do perfectly. Do I have that next? Um, what our Lord and Our Lady do perfectly is what Adam and Eve failed to do. Right? So Eve was his helpmate and was supposed to help Adam, but she didn't. Instead of saying, yes, Adam, fight the devil, obey God and trust him, even if that means death, don't worry about it because God will save you. God will resurrect you, Adam. Uh, Eve instead leads him into sin and Adam doesn't have the strength to stand up and he cowers and he neglects his responsibility and he's afraid of death and he doesn't stand up to the devil and so Jesus will do all the opposite Jesus will Jesus will say no I will obey my father no matter what even if it means death and he does suffer a real death and his body and his soul are separated in his humanity he suffers death and Our Lady will say yes you must do this and she will encourage him all along the path to accept that suffering and that death. So everything that Adam and Eve didn't get right, the new Adam and the new Eve come 2,000 years later and do get it right. And this is God's plan from the beginning. Sin will also require reparation. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in the next talk, but just very briefly right now. Reparation is obviously repairing the evil that was done, correcting the evil that is done. But doing it really not just out of, like, in a courtroom with a judge who issues justices to try to correct things, because sometimes that doesn't quite correct it, even though someone has to, let's say, pay the crime of being in jail or paying a fine. Um, reparation is far more than that, because reparation is not just motivated by justice, that's an element, but above all, reparation is motivated by love. Right? So reparation will be this concept, for example, that a child recognizes, okay, I've offended my parent, and so I'm going to try to fix it, but I'm fixing it because I love them. 
And so as I fix the problem, I will show them that I love them. And as you can see, when that happens, if that ever does happen, in any kind of you know, split you've had with anybody, it could be a friend, it could be a spouse, it could be your own parent, but if you realize that, okay, yes, they've offended me, we sin, that happens, we fall, but now they're trying to make up for it, they're trying to change, and they're doing it because they love me, right? And they're, they're suffering for it. It's, it's a, you know, something uncomfortable, something difficult they have to do, but they're doing it out of love. That brings the two of you closer together. And that's what reparation is meant to do. So we have a love that motivates us, and that's why we seek to undo the wrong and offer our compassion, our consolation to the person, which then unites us closer to that person in a much stronger relationship than before the sin. That's ultimately the concept behind reparation, and that's also required. So, of course, our Lord is the one who can offer this perfect redemption. Man cannot save himself on his own. We would have been lost without our Lord. And we can't offer the necessary reparation either because the offense is infinite when we sin against God's infinite and divine majesty. So basically, man is lost. For all eternity, we're lost if it were not for the goodness of God. So to satisfy justice and also to go above and beyond, so to offer reparation out of his infinite goodness, to extend this great love and mercy, our Lord, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, becomes man. And of course, he takes his flesh from the Virgin and he will die on the cross for us. And this really does show, I mean, if you really think about it, when you want to, I mean, this is one of the reasons why God has allowed sin. Because it's one thing to love someone who's never offended you, but it, it's a far greater thing to love someone who has offended you terribly and to forgive them. And so we would probably never have such a great insight into God's, how great God's love is and how great his mercy is if we hadn't sinned. And then he hadn't come and to save us, right? Insofar as we fall further and further, and God still extends forgiveness and still loves us, we become more and more aware of how infinite and great he is. To the point where very often I think to myself, that's certainly so far beyond me, right? I, I, I could not forgive that way. I mean, I pray for the grace to do it. And with God's grace, all things are possible. But certainly on our own natural powers, we can never do what God does. And that should make us stand more and more in awe of just how great and perfect God's goodness really is. Uh, and we see that in display through our Lord and Our Lady. Um, as we talked yesterday in the great sacrifices that Our Lady makes of her own self-will, and I was saying God first and God alone, she becomes the co-redemptrix working with her son and the mediatrix of all graces. Then of course our Lord founds his church. As I mentioned, it flows forth. We see it sacramentally in the Holy Eucharist and baptism the water and the blood that flow from his pierced sacred heart upon the cross. Uh, and the church is created from the side of Christ, and the church is created without sin, birthed by the sufferings that Mary has. The labor pains of Mary are not in giving birth to Jesus Christ, her son. The church fathers will always tell us that that was painless for her because she was sinless, and that Christ passed out of her womb, leaving her virginity, her perpetual and perfect virginity intact, much as the way that rays of light pass through glass. So that was different, but she still has great, great labor pains, and they're far greater than any woman because she labors to bring us into birth, us, all of her children that God has entrusted to her. And the church, of course, is made without sin, also for eternal life, for the beatific vision. The church is also made to serve the king and the queen. And of course, the church will also be tested. All of us will be tested. Um, so that's really what our life is now about. It's, you know, you're living and you're living you could say that eternal test that Adam and Eve faced, that Jesus and Our Lady faced. We have the poor examples in our first parents. We have the perfect examples in Christ and Our Lady. And so we could say that this is really Our Lady's role in the plan of salvation, to help us understand God's plan and to get back to heaven. And she gives us the perfect model. And if we go with her and with her aid, we will also pass the test and get to heaven. So, now, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and very, very quickly go through a little bit of church history. Uh, we could do this with the Old Testament, but you can also do it with history. And all I'm going to try to do here very quickly is through a few events I've picked. Again, there's so many more. And hopefully you can even maybe reflect on your own life and find these kinds of events as well. Show that, what I call that dynamic of 
the, the punishment, which isn't really a punishment, but rather how every time there is this grave problem, God sends us just the right solution. And the solution can fix the problem and then elevate us to a higher level. And so some examples that we could all, I think, think of. So you have the revolt. That's like the devil, the revolt against God's right order. And then you have grace coming in. So fixing the revolt and healing and elevating. So God always giving us the antidote to the revolt and an elevation in grace in his solution. So you have things like we know back in pagan Rome. You had the, the great paganism. And so what did God allow? God allowed this great age of martyrs where the blood of martyrs became the seed. And that's ultimately what converted you know, the Roman Empire and brought about Christianity as, uh, as no longer being persecuted. But there was a lot of suffering involved. Uh, but the martyrs what got us through that. And then you had these great, the next phase after Christianity was accepted, you know, Constantine, the great emperor, outlaws, the persecution of Christians. You enter a period of great Christological controversies. Where now basically we could say the civilized world is Catholic here, and yet they begin to argue about who Christ is. But God allows that so that you have great heretics like Arius and Nestorius and others. But God allows these great controversies so that the church can reflect upon the truth of who the Son is. And we come up with the great creeds and the great professions of our faith. We come to a deeper understanding of who Christ is and what the ecumenical council is. And you get a much better sense of the church and the role of the Pope and the bishops. So all this extra grace that the church is getting, and that's why he allowed those great heresies to affect the church. And then we know that shortly after that came the great barbaric hordes that came sweeping across Europe decimated the, Holy Ro the, the Roman Empire at the time that had existed for a thousand years. Rome falls, barbarians overrun the land. But God provides for that because he does it through his monks, primarily. The monks of St. Benedict out of Italy and also monks who had gone to Ireland. And they carry the light of Christ and they carry civilization. And the monks then began to go all across Europe reconverting all the pagan nations. France becomes the first and eldest daughter of the church. She's the first, you know, barbarians who become Catholic under King Clovis and St. Clotilde, the great bishop, um, Remigius. And as that's happening, and the Irish monks are sort of preserving civilization and elevating us out of what is commonly called the Dark Ages, we then know that the great Muslim hordes sweep out of the deserts of Arabia. And they cover North Africa and they destroy many lands that have been Christian for very long, but had fallen into much heresy and suffered from much heresy. And they fall and they even enter into, ready to conquer all of Christendom. Uh, but they're stopped at the Battle of Tours by a great, great French leader, Charles Martel, who will be the grandfather of Charlemagne. And so as the Muslims invade, you begin to see the rise of Christendom. You begin to see the rise of these Christian kings who will work together in concert with the Pope for a better civilization. And Charlemagne will recreate the great Holy Roman Empire and unite all of Europe so that it's under a Christian king and under a Christian pope. And he'll begin the great university systems and great learning. And so there'll be this great learning and knowledge. And so now uh, culture gets elevated yet again. Um, and so it goes. Um, time and time again, you have these various difficulties and problems. You have great problems in the 10th century with papal corruption. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a rough time, lay, investiture, sodomy in the church, um, nepotism, and you have some great popes who are then called forth and some great religious orders like the Cluniacs and the Cistercians that again help elevate the church out of that uh, and, and bring it to a higher level. And you have wealth and a certain level of ignorance among Catholics not taking their faith seriously. And so God allows the Dominicans and the Franciscans to rise, the great mendicant orders in St. Francis and Dominic, the great order of preachers, and they live this poverty and they live the gospel as no one else has really lived before, elevating us yet again. Uh, you have the Renaissance and that brings with it much corruption. The Renaissance are turning in a focus on man and on the things of this world as opposed to upon God. You have terrible things like the great schisms in the church. Uh, you know, this, this re rejection of Christ's good order. And we really had reached a kind of climax in Western civilization, I would argue, around the late 1200s, 1300s. This is a time when the great cathedrals, like the great cathedrals of Chartres, are being built. Uh, great music is being composed. The arts are flourishing. The universities are flourishing. St. Thomas Aquinas is writing his Summa. Right? The whole world is just this spirit of you know, Catholicism and faith that imbues it. Uh, but there, there's a turn against that. There is the, the schism with the East and the schism in the West. There's the papacy in Avignon. And so the devil's always at work. right? And yet that paves the way for the Renaissance. That paves the way ultimately for the Protestant revolt 
Um, that's really, I would think, in some ways, a real turning point. Uh, with the weaknesses in the papacy that came about through the Avignon captivity, the Eastern Schism, and then the Great Western Schism, it sort of opened the window, opened the door for the Protestant revolt to take place, which is ultimately a rejection of the Church of Christ and the authority of Christ's Church. And contrary to what many people think, it was not largely fueled by religious ideals, as some would say that you know, Martin Luther or John Calvin and others had. It was largely fueled, well, by their particular sins. Martin Luther, a very sinful man, and we will not get into some of the disgusting sins he did, um, but it was largely kept alive by the Christian kings who wanted power for themselves, who wanted wealth and power. And so men like Henry VIII in England, who wanted power for themselves, as well as his own lustful desires, and the great dukes and counts and barons of the German lands and up in Sweden, they all saw this as an opportunity to get wealth for themselves because wealth came in the form of land and the church had a lot of that land, which the church actually used also to help the poor. Um, and they, they should, it's a sad story with England. England never had any sort of poverty. It was merry old England. Uh, and it was, you know, Mary's dowry. It was a country very devoted to Our Lady. But Henry VIII destroyed all the monasteries, took all their wealth and created great poverty in his land because then the people who supported him in his revolt against the church uh, he had to give them the wealth, and they never cared for the poor the way that the church had in the past. And that's kind of a story that's gone on and on. I don't, I don't want to get too much into history because we're going to focus here on the Turning Revolt. And I would say that it seems, the way I look at history, that up until this point, that's why I call it a turning point, we were following this dynamic of there's a great sin, all the ones I've mentioned before, and God would give a solution and men and the church would accept the solution and therefore rise to a higher level of civilization. But it seems that after this great problem in the papacy and the Protestant revolt, God still kept giving the solutions, but they began to not be fully embraced by men and by the church. It, it was more at first and less and less and less. And so the revolt continued to steadily decline. And we really have seen a steady decline in that revolt since the Protestant Revolution. Uh, you had, for example, the great heresy of Jansenism, which won't go into it too much, but basically it's Catholic Calvinism. Uh, it believes in a very strict God, not a God of love, and a God who predestines, it's called double predestination, who creates souls just to send them to hell, uh, which, is, which is a terrible heresy. And so what does God do? God gives the great devotion of the Sacred Heart to show the great love that our Lord has. And that was like the right cure for the Jansenists. But there was a lot of resistance to it within the church. St. Louis de Montfort, one of my favorite saints, who's, who's very Marian, uh, was also very devoted to the Sacred Heart, and was constantly having to struggle against the Jansenists, who did a lot to persecute him and squash him in France. And you know, this is during the 1600s. Uh, so, yes, we get the solution, the Sacred Heart. It's supposed to fight Jansenism, and it's supposed to have the king consecrate France to the Sacred Heart, but that's not done. The king doesn't consecrate France to the Sacred Heart, and the church doesn't embrace it as strongly as it should. And so Jansenism kind of keeps creeping into the church and, and kind of stays alive in many ways. There's still strains of it, even to this day, unfortunately. And then comes along the quote-unquote enlightenment, I really call it the darkening, when we begin to elevate our human reason above God's divine revelation. We trust less in God's word, and we trust more in our own mind, and in our own thought, in our own science. And, you know, maybe the man who spearheaded that the most, or at least got the ball rolling, is someone like Rene Descartes, who says, I think, therefore I am, which is utterly ridiculous, because in order to think, you must already exist. Your existence precedes your ability to think. It would have been far better for him to have said, God thinks, therefore I am, right? It's because God speaks, his logos, his thought, that we exist. We are not the authors of our own existence, and we cannot refashion our own existence as we will. God creates us. God thinks, and therefore we exist, and therefore we can think and do things. But Descartes flips that all around. Ironically, he was a Catholic, and he was actually still trying to get around showing God's existence, but he went about it the wrong way, and he flips it. And so now we have this understanding that we ourselves are authors of our own reality. And we have gotten to the point, 400 years later, where we're so insane that we're accepting that if a man says he's a woman, we all are supposed to say, oh yeah, he is, because he redefines his own reality. Or if school children are saying, oh, I'm a cat, I'm a dog, and they want to scratch and bite their peers, all the teachers stand by and say, well, you have to let them do that and put a litter box for them because they're, they're little animals. They're redefining. They're, this is insane. We have gone down a hole of madness that is very destructive. 
But it's all this process of this great revolt against God and a rejection of Him. Freemasonry grows. It's always been around, but it really grows strong at this time. And their main goal is to destroy the Catholic Church because they want to oppose God. And they want a new world order that is no longer Christendom, that no longer has the state and the church united under God in the perfect order, but rather has a certain elite group in charge of everything, the whole world, a one world government, and a one world religion, where religion is not about God, but it's a religion that just glorifies man and ultimately serves the interests of that ruling class, and where they really do use religion as an opium of the masses to subdue the masses and to keep them under control. So Freemasonry is really a, a, a Satan's master plan to upend all of God's right order. And that is really going at this time. They're all the fathers of the French Revolution. And quite, fa quite frankly, uh, not, not to uh, hopefully scandalize anyone too much, but I'll say it nonetheless, to give you the truth, uh, even all the founders of this country, which we love so much, they were seeped in these ideas of the Enlightenment and of Freemasonry. And many of the principles that are held uh, as cherished by Americans are not Catholic whatsoever. Um, we have to understand that. We can still be patriotic and we should be patriotic and we should love our country. That's a great virtue and we're supposed to love our country. But that doesn't mean we have to love the errors that our country has seeped in. Uh, so that's going on. The French Revolution is unleashed, causes many problems under these false ideas, great sounding words of liberty for all, equality for all, fraternity among all men. These are truths, but they have been perverted by the French Revolution. Right? They misunderstand what liberty truly is. They misunderstand what fraternity and true brotherhood amongst men is. The only place you're really going to find true brotherhood again amongst men is in the kingdom of Christ. That's the only place where you'll find peace that's based upon the love of Christ and the cross of Christ and the true worship of God. But they get rid of all that. And once you get rid of all that, there can be no true brotherhood. There will only be sin and only be division with a you know, the stronger power being, being right, might making right. So wealth and power and money and force of arms controlling the things. And then just pacifying everyone by telling them, no, you've got this, this brotherhood amongst all men. Right? You don't have any possessions and you'll be happy. No private property, no private creativity, just be little robots and automatons and do your little job and, and you'll be happy. You know, th this is kind of where we're headed and this is ultimately what the devil wants to do. What the devil is trying to do here is take away our free will. Now, that is his plan because in this great gift of free will, remember that's how we were made in the image and likeness of God. We have a mind to know the truth and a will to choose the good and to love. That's our soul. Don't let anyone tell you that we don't have a soul we don't know we have a soul. What is the soul? The soul is your mind and your will. Do you have a mind? Well, yes. Can you know truth? Yes. Okay. Do you have a will? Can you choose things? Yes. Okay, then you have a soul. It's as simple as that. But it's through your soul that you love. Right? That's really where our image and likeness of God comes from. And that's why God gives us this free will, so that we can choose to love Him. Were we to lose our will, we could no longer love. Ah, it's true, you no longer sin uh, if you don't have a will. A rock has no will. It doesn't commit sins, but it also doesn't love. And God could have made children of Abraham out of the rocks if he had wanted to, but that's not what he chose, right? So what the devil wants to do ultimately is just strip you of your free will. Every sin, with every sin you commit, you actually willfully tie up, enslave your will more and more. Because free will, back to what liberty is, free will is not I can do whatever I want. That is a completely false concept. What free will is, is the power to do the good. The power to do the good. To know the truth, and then to do the good. And the ultimate good is to be selfless, not to think of yourself, and to choose the good for the other. So it's a selfless act, it's a sacrifice to love the other. I choose your good, I want you to go, to, and that, the ultimate good is going to heaven. So basically what love really is, and what loving is, is saying, I want you to go to heaven and I'm going to put myself at whatever sacrifice and do whatever difficult thing I have to do. I'm going to divest myself of my own self-interest so that you can get closer to that goal of getting to heaven. Right? That's really what love is. But it always entails a certain sacrifice because it's a death to my own self. And that's what we see Adam and Eve didn't do. That's what we see that our Lord and our Lady did do. Okay? And if you don't have a will, you can't do that. And every sin takes away will. You have less power 
less strength of will to do the good with each sin. And some people get so mired in sin. I mean, you see it very clearly when we have like addictions. I mean, it, you, everyone probably knows, if not personally, a story of someone who's addicted to a drug or alcohol or some vice. And in many ways, they're not really that free anymore. Right? They, they are compulsive now. They, they need that vice. In many ways, their free will is gone. By sin after sin, after sin, after sin they've, they've willfully given up their free will to, to Satan, to sin, to death. And that is what the devil ultimately wants. So he wants to strip us all of our free will, to annihilate our will. So we don't have a will and we can't love. And that, that, that's where this great revolution is headed. Man not only rejects the church, but he rejects Christ. And uh, well, we've already kind of gotten into this. The revolution continues into our own 18th and 19th, uh, our 19th and 20th centuries. We have Marxism. Uh, we have evolution, denying God's existence, that we just were created by chance, that God doesn't exist. That's the ultimate error of evolution. It's atheistic in nature. And we have now, if there is no God, then we all are just cogs in a machine, and our life doesn't matter that much. And so totalitarian regimes can arise. We can have great anarchy in the world and great tyranny to control that anarchy and to control others, and unimaginable violence, hatred, and evil. It's ironic that men of the 20th century think that they have become so enlightened and so smart and that they're better than the men of centuries past that were quote-unquote religious and superstitious. And yet the 20th century has killed more people than all the other centuries of mankind's history put together. And it's been by these totalitarian, atheistic, pro-Marxist, pro-evolutionary systems of thinking and leaders who have affected these tremendous genocides and mass murders upon their fellow man. Including, of course, the scourge of abortion. But millions and millions and millions have died in the 20th century like never before. So, so we're not more enlightened. And we're not more civilized. Because we haven't followed God's plan, we've actually become more barbaric and more hateful towards one another. That's what happens when we reject God. But Our Lady has a plan in this entire salvation. And I would say that as I've studied history, I really do think World War I is, is the breaking point. That's kind of, in my mind, almost this point as of no return. Because in the entire 1900s, there were many evil forces trying to push the world towards this terrible, it was called the Great War back then, because no one had ever seen anything like it before. But you still had the church and the popes fighting it. Right? Like the, the, the Protestant revolt was a great revolt. We talked about that's kind of when it starts. But the, the church still had Trent. And they still had great saints and great missionary orders and great missionary zeal. And so there was, there was, it, was, it was a fight. It was like a real fight where you sort of maybe didn't know who was going to win, if you will. And the 1800s are a little bit like that, although the communists and the atheists are definitely getting upper hand. But the church is still fighting back and fighting back and fighting back. And you still have Christian nations, nations that are Christian. World War I did away with all that. With the end of World War I, every Christian state is gone. The Pope gives up all of his temporal authority. It, it really is the death now to Christendom, to this right order that God had wanted us to live, where the church and the state were united under God and worked together for the flourishing and the good of man, both here on this earth, but his eternal good as well. And I find it fascinating that when that's happening, and Christian brother is killing Christian brother on the battlefield of Europe, in terrible ways, the way they had never decimated each other before, just sending you know, thousands and thousands of young men up against the machine guns and the tear gas and the barbed wire fence, and there were just bodies littered everywhere, and we killed off our Christian youth. That's when Our Lady appeared at Fatima. And again, this is why I go back to that very central theme, that God continues to give us the right solution for the right time. Up until that point, there were other solutions that could have worked. Things that the popes were doing. Pius X and Pius IX and Leo XIII had done a lot. And we had other solutions. We had the Sacred Heart and we had the Rosary. And especially in the 1900s, we get the devotion to the Holy Face. And unfortunately, it's not popularized the way it should have been to fight off communism and other revolutionary men. And so in the midst of this terrible war where we're at a breaking point and Christendom is being undone, God sends his mother with the only solution. And so she continues to play this very important role in God's plan. Once again, man is being testified. Uh, <laughs> man is being tested. 
which means we're being purified. Uh, and what this requires, in this case, our test is ultimately, will we be obedient to the message that God is sending to us through Our Lady, or will we be disobedient? But it's the same thing. It's like back in the garden. If Adam and Eve had been obedient, then they would have gotten these great graces. They would have been elevated into the beatific vision. Right? It would have been this wonderful world. But they failed. So then there were terrible chastisements. Sin entered the world. And we talked about all those things that sin brought with it. Death and the problems in our mind, our body, our will, our alienation from one another, alienation from God. I mean, that sin brought about great problems. It's always that way. There's that test. Look at the devils and the angels. They had tests. They were tested. And there was great glory for the ones who passed the test and terrible chastisements for the ones that didn't. That, that's how this works. Ultimately, the test is, do you love God? Do you obey God? Do you trust Him? Do you want to be with Him? Do you choose His path or do you choose your own path? No matter how well intended it may be, we know the devil lies in good intentions. And so again, we're standing at a real precipice in the history of mankind, and the solution that has been offered to us by God has been brought to us by his very own mother. It is devotion to her immaculate heart. If we obey, there are going to be great graces. We've seen, and, and ultimately, that is what's going to happen. You, know, you can't stop God's plan. So it's better to get on board with this plan and further it than try to oppose it and be on the wrong side, because there are also the chastisements that we will suffer otherwise. Again, not because God chooses them per se, because we choose them by our sin and continue to alienate ourselves from God. I was very briefly, but I think we're, we're sort of out of time, so we're going to go really quick. Our Lady has always been interceding. Her very first apparition that we know of was to St. James. So Our Lady's still alive in the Holy Land, and St. James is in Spain trying to convert the pagans there. And he's very disillusioned, but she appears to him in Saragossa on the banks of the Ebro River. So that's Our Lady of the Pillar back around 40 AD. And she shows her maternal solicitude. And she says, build a church. Come here. You know, I will help you. I will be with you. So she's giving great solace. Um, I always remind people of this because I tell them also, theme from yesterday, Marian devotion is apostolic. And Marian apparitions were actually apostolic. The first one happened in the age of the apostles. And the apostles were testifying to it. So really that whole concept of Marian apparitions and devotion to Mary and our Marian interceding is of public revelation. It was there from the very beginning. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why God had his blessed mother appear to St. James in Spain. Um, 1251, she gives St. Dominic the rosary, our spiritual sword. And in 1251, she appears to St. Simon Stock, gives him the scapular. With each one of these, if you study the issues behind them, you'll see that, that there's that great problem, that there's great sin, and God gives just the perfect solution. And then the solution gets us out of the problem and elevates us with both the scapular and the rosary. Our Lady even made a prophecy back then that one day she would save the world by the rosary and the scapular. And I believe that points to Fatima and us are fulfilling the message of Fatima because both of those play such an important role We've talked a bit about Our Lady of Guadalupe appearing to Juan Diego, the right solution that this continent needed so that there will be many, many conversions that could not be affected without her, the Battle of Lepanto that the Rosary accomplishes. Um, and then we reach a kind of age of Mary, which is, again is very interesting because just as the revolution is really ramping up with the Enlightenment and the Freemasons and the blow-up of the French Revolution in 1789, then shortly after that there becomes an intensification of Marian apparitions. It's like now our Blessed Mother starts coming more and more. You could say because the devil has ramped up his weaponry and he's fighting so much more. Remember, history is all this great battle between the dragon and Our Lady. And so as the devil has sort of increased his forces and is ramping his attack up, so God allows Our Lady and gives her the grace that she will now ramp up her forces and, and increase her defense and her counterattack to squash and quench the devil. And so the 1800s become a kind of age of Mary. And where did this really take place? Where did this whole thing blow up? Well, it blew up in the eldest daughter of the church, in France. That's where the Enlightenment really got strong. That's where the French Revolution takes place. So that's where Our Lady, that becomes the primary battleground. That's where all these apparitions of Our Lady start happening in this age of Mary. So you have 1830 is, I think, the one that sort of signals the beginning of this, when she appeals to Rue de Bac in Paris to Catherine Labouré and gives her the miraculous medal. Right, and shows the two hearts of Jesus and Mary. They're intertwined. It has the cross and the M of Our Lady. It shows the two of them united. And it works, affects great miracles. It begins to convert atheists. It converts Jews and brings them into the Catholic faith. That's why it's called the Miraculous Medal because it made so many miraculous conversions as well as, as, well as physical miracle, miraculous healings. Right? And, and she shows it's Our Lady interceding all the graces that she brings to us. We see her role as mediatrix of all graces there as well. And co-redemptrix because the cross and the M are so intertwined. And then she appears at La Salette in 1846, up in the French Alps in the south. And here she's crying, Our Lady crying tears, because 
she says, I can no longer hold the, 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 the wrathful arm of my son, primarily because men are violating the second and third commandment. They can't stop swearing. They can't stop using his name in vain. And they no longer are keeping the Sunday, the Lord's Day, holy. Those were the two great offenses that Our Lady cried for and said the wrath of God will punish us. Yes, the sins against the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th commandments are terrible, and often we're more aware of those because I think they affect us humans more. Commandments 4 through 10 are among relations that men have with men, but commandments 1 through 3 are the relationships man has with God, and that always takes priority. And so a violation of the 2nd and 3rd commandment is actually worse than a violation of the 7th or 5th or 6th or 8th commandment. And that's what she's crying about at La Salette. She says, men have to stop offending God. Then she appears at Lourdes, 1858, to confirm what the Pope has just said, that she is the Immaculate Conception. Four years after the Pope declares it infallibly, she appears and reveals her name as the Immaculata. And she gives great healing, right? No more miracles, certified scientific miracles, have taken place healings than at Lourdes. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of miracles that have taken place at Lourdes. Our Lady was coming to show an atheistic world that God exists and that God loves us and that God is involved in our life and that prayer has power, that she has power. All this, of course, taking place in France. Lady of pont Maine, you know, she's appearing there in 1871 during the Franco-Prussian War where France was being defeated by her enemies. Uh, a Catholic France being defeated by Protestant Prussia. And she tells them there will be peace, but you have to pray. Much prayer is needed. Um, she appears in Knock, which is in Ireland. Um, she appears here in the United States, in Campion, Wisconsin, talking about how important it is to educate children in the faith. A great emphasis on the children. Again, that's connected to Fatima. Education of the children. She appears to children. She does that also in La Salette. Children, do you say your prayers well? The lady always has this emphasis for the children to learn the faith and to say their prayers well. She realizes it's very important for the faith to be handed on. It's great concern for the children and many of these apparitions. There really are many themes, I'm not doing them justice because we are out of time, um, that, that threads to and really climaxes in the message that Our Lady brings at Fatima. Uh, one other that is not a Marian apparition, but I think it's good to know. And then, and then there's also others that come after Fatima. Uh, I see Fatima sort of like I said yesterday with the Gospel. All the Old Testament leads up to Fatima and then all the rest of the, I'm sorry, all the Old Testament leads up to the Gospel, the life of Christ. And then all the rest of the New Testament, the letters of the apostles are a reflection upon the gospel and the life of Christ. Well, similarly, I would say all these Marian apparitions that are happening are leading up to Fatima, and then everything that's happened after Fatima is a reflection, really, upon Fatima and a connection back, because we still haven't obeyed Fatima. We still haven't gotten to that because, again, the message of Fatima is to bring about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. So you have an apparition, which actually happened in the 1600s, Our Lady of Good Success, down in Quito, Ecuador, but it wasn't well known until the 20th century, and there's great harmony between that message of Our Lady and Fatima and gives greater understanding of the message of Fatima. She appears in Rome as the Virgin of the Apocalypse in 1947 to an atheist who wanted to assassinate the Pope, and she converts him and does great miracles, but brings a very strong message that's very connected to Fatima. So I encourage you to learn about the Virgin of Revelation, the Apocalypse at Rome. I encourage you to learn about Our Lady of Good Success, as well as Our Lady of Akita in Japan, also very connected to the message at Fatima. Um, so all these other apparitions are coming, but they're sort of reflecting back on Fatima to help us understand the message of Fatima because we still have not paid attention to it. And then there's St. John Bosco's Dream. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it. It's online. Um, this happened like in 1864, 1861, um, and I think it's very well connected with Fatima because what he sees is he sees a boat. I'm just going to paraphrase the story. Read it for yourself because there's a lot of good details in there that I won't cover. But there, there is a boat which represents the church, and the Pope is there, and the bishops are there, and there's other little boats that belong to it that are sailing around it. Those are kind of like the other dioceses in the world, and many enemies come and attack the church. It's interesting, because one of the main weapons they use are bad books. They're using, you would never think that a book is a weapon, but it is, so they're, they're using like this bad literature. Uh, and that was happening a lot in the 1900s with all those revolutionary ideas we were talking about. And then at one moment, the Pope calls them all together, that's the first Vatican Council, which was about to happen in five or six years, so it's already a prophecy. But it ends abruptly because the attack intensifies. This is when the Italian Revolutionary Armies attacked the Vatican, and the first Vatican Council ended before it could really finish. It just had a few months, and everybody had to go back because the armies were invading Rome and the Vatican. Uh, so St. John Bosco sees that before. He talks about they gather together, but then the enemy intensifies attacks, so they have to scatter back to their ships, but then the Pope calls them back again, and they reunite again. So I think that was him even foreseeing the next council, the Second Vatican Council. And then he talks about how there's a moment where the Pope dies. The, the enemies of the church kill the Pope, and 
they rejoice because there's going to be a great victory now. They believe they've won. Which is an interesting point because you would think, well, any time a pope dies, that, 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 I mean, yes, it's sad, but we just elect another pope and, and the pope keeps going. So why would the death of a pope cause you to think that you'd won? It reminds us of Napoleon. Napoleon actually tried to eliminate the papacy. He said he was going to kill the pope and do away with the church. And he took the pope, Paul VI, away, and the pope does die in French captivity. And without Napoleon knowing, the bishops gathered in secret, I believe in Venice, and, and they elected the next pope, Paul VII, before Napoleon's armies could do anything about it. And so then there was another pope. Um, fascinating pope, but I, it's also fascinating how Napoleon, who kind of is an antichrist, he's a type of the antichrist, um, even said, you know, what, what does this pope think he can command me? Does he think he's just going to make the weapons fall from my soldiers' arms, if you've heard that? And it's ironic because when his army was marching back from Russia in the great cold and was suffering from frostbite, literally the weapons were just falling from his soldiers' arms. You know? um, and so, so it did have falling from his, from his soldiers' hands. Uh, again, there's great power that God has. We just have to trust it. So I, I see parallels with that. The pope dies. And then it, St. John Bosco basically gives you the understanding that miraculously another pope comes up in his place. It's sort of like no one expected. That's the part that I find very curious because we would always expect there to be another pope after one dies. Um, but in his dream, a pope comes in some miraculous way, and it's that pope who then ties the bark of Peter to the two great anchors of the Eucharist and Our Lady. And as soon as he attaches the bark of Peter to those two great anchors, the waters become calm, and it's no longer violent, and the enemies of the church turn on themselves and destroy themselves. It's not like the church even has to do it. All the church has to do, all the pope really has to do is anchor the church very solidly to the Holy Eucharist and to our Blessed Mother, to Jesus Christ and to his mother. Which is again the theme we've been talking about, this whole plan in God's salvation. And, and that's what the message of Fatima is about, as we talked about yesterday. Devotion to the Immaculate Heart and the great reverence for the Holy Eucharist that we need. To really believe in his real presence and to be tied to that. And then after that happens and the enemies are fighting amongst themselves, all the other little ships start coming back to the bark. So you see the schisms being healed. You see maybe the, the bishops that were off in left field, you know, doing different things, starting to realize, oh no, I, I should be faithful and orthodox. But we're going to need a strong pope who is strong because he trusts our Lord and our Lady. And I believe that's also the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart. That's that connection. That's what's going to affect these things and make the waters calm, destroy the enemies of the church, and bring the church back into full unity. So I see this great harmony between what St. John Bosco saw in his dream and what Our Lady Fatima revealed you know, some 50 years later. So, that's the plan that our Lord has, this great battle, the lady versus the dragon. We saw it before the beginning. We saw it at the creation of man. We see it in the fall. We see it in the redemption. We saw it in Christendom. We saw it in the great revolution against Christ that began. We see it with the age of Mary. We see it in the apostasy that is taking place today in the church. But we also know that there will be a triumph, the Immaculate Heart. That is the great role that she plays. And with that, we're going to take a little break, and then we'll come back to talk about some specifics of that plan for our time. <laughs>